Um, so just yeah, just a quick recap of uh, of the pushing and crouching. Obviously, we want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, but at the same time, you can only learn from your mistakes. Yeah. So sometimes you've got to do it a couple of times and make the same mistake. <laughs> yeah, see, Mum, I could push myself. <laughs> Uh, it's a part of life, and there's no, nothing's perfect. It's always imperfectly perfect. So you know, stop aiming for perfection and start getting real. <laughs> See, daughter, <laughs> stop being perfect. You know? um, no, but it's you know, it's really important that you're you're not striving to be perfect all the time. It's a full-time job doing that. And we've all been there, and we all tried it, but it doesn't work. You know, it sets us up for failure. So rather than be uh, you know, trying to be that type A personality, which most of us are, that's how we got here in the first place. We need to kind of lessen our, um, I guess, our expectation, which will then allow us in a healing state to move forwards, if that makes sense. Because if we're putting a lot of expectation on ourselves, it's super hard to move forward. You know, and I speak that from a personal experience, not just with illness, but with life. You know, if we're always putting expectation on ourselves, we're not going to perform at the highest level. Um, you know, or we might for a little while, but we're always going to suffer long term. And you know, I think life is not, you know, life is not about suffering. Life is about suffering, and then learning from it, and then growing from it. Um, that's what I feel anyway. Um, so yeah, just with the push and crash cycle, learn from the valley of death a few times. You know, you know, it's important that you do do some events. I mean, sometimes you might have to go to a wedding, or you might have something really important that you have to attend, and you know that there's going to be payback for that. Sometimes you've got to weigh up if it's a how year or a, or a no. So what I say to my clients, my online guys, um, if you've got an event that's gonna, you're going to gain a lot from or feel good from or you know, that you really want to do, but you know there's going to be payback, that's a how year moment because you'd rather do that event and have the payback than not do it at all. Okay? We have them in life. All right? Sometimes we've got to do it, that's okay. Again, just weigh up your priorities. Is it worth pushing through it and, and getting to where you want to go? Or is it better to listen to your body, be smarter, and then get to your end goal, which is obviously to be optimal and perfect and amazing and kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, pushing and crash, crashing is one of the hardest lessons to learn. I think it took me two years to get there. But once I started avoiding that, I started to progress, and that was probably the most important thing in my recovery. Um, I'll talk about movement and, and exercise later. Um, but it's also important with progression. But remember, 5% improvements and progressions are super important. 5 to 10% don't aim for too much too early. Yeah? Long term results. Okay, hands up if you're stressed with this illness or it's caused stress before. <laughs> if it hasn't, then it's like, hands up if you don't have problem taking your stress. Yeah, never again. Cool. Okay, life, yeah. Uh, you know, this is a part of it, stress. And so, um, I want to talk about stress because. Um, when I was when I was at the conference with chronic fatigue syndrome in uh, America, stress was uh, the number one cause of chronic illness in the world right now. That was the stats, um, and it makes sense. So it might not be the thing that got you to where you're at, but it might be the thing that's holding you back, all right, in life. Um, and sometimes we don't know it, but we can be our own worst enemies and victims um, of our own illness if we if we allow it. Okay. Uh, and over time, if, we, if we're if continually stressed or anxious, which is a part of it, like I said before, it is a neurological disease, but you can't tell me that walking outside for 10 minutes is not scary when you're so sick. Yeah, it's scary. Um, you know, driving is scary. I've got lots of clients who don't come, who, who get driven to my centre, but then they're in their 30s and 40s because it's hard to drive, it's scary. Um, but over time, if we can overcome that, it's going to improve. Okay. I was super anxious when I was sick. You know, I look really confident now, I'm happy and all that kind of stuff. But when I was sick, um, I remember I had a party to go to one night and um, mum was driving me there. And I don't remember this because I was so sick, but she brought it up with me a while ago. And apparently I just went great when we got to the front door of this party. And I just freaked out and I was like, if I step out of that car, I'm going to be sick. I can't do it. And she just looked at me and we had to drive home. You know. And there was lots of occasions that happened like that, you know. Um, I tend to block them out now because I don't remember them well. I try to choose the good days. Um, but, you know, anxiety is a big part of it. And it's important we overcome it. So the first question I'll ask you, or if you've got notes that you can write this down, is what are you telling yourself? You know, I've been, I'm really into, like, uh, TED Talks and videos and inspirational stuff at the moment. And 
Um, a lot of the, the scientists and the researchers are coming out with, you know, mental rehearsal, um, you know, NLP coaching and all that kind of stuff. It's all coming out that, you know, what we, what we talk about most or what we believe in comes true. Okay? Um, for the first two, two years of my illness, everyone asked me, how are you going? And because I was sick and not well, I'm, I'm sick, I'm, I'm, I'm crap, I can't play basketball, you know, I can't even like, you know, I can't even go out, can't eat breakfast, lunch and dinner, I'm too tired, I sleep 17 hours a day, you know, my life sucks. That's what I said, because it did. Um, Mum and Dad, Toby, do you want to go for dinner tonight? No, I'm too sick. Hey, what are you doing on the weekend? No, I'm too sick, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. What happens is we tell ourselves everything we can't do. And, and over time we realise, you know, we get stuck in this mentality that we don't even know what we can do. Okay, so the first thing you need, to, you need to evaluate is what are you telling yourself? Is it good or is it bad? And then you can have an action plan towards overcoming that. This is not an overnight thing, okay? I'm not saying it's all in your head, but I'm saying that if there are, if there is stress and anxiety going on, you need to work with that, okay? Um, I didn't realise, yep. Yeah. I find. Yes. She's the opposite. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think the most things that nearly get stressed about is trying to deal with it. What can I do? What can't I do? Why can't I do it? But what if I do this? But then tomorrow I'll be ill. Then yeah, I'll be better. so that comes down to the, the, the I, think, I think she gets more stressed about coping with it. That's right. Then yeah. cause it. Absolutely. So, yeah, so with that, it's really important that we go back to that final. Because we all go through different stages with this illness, yeah? And there's stages. And if you look at this triangle, you know, <clears throat> that's still in survival mode in a way because it's like pushing, crashing, not knowing, doing, not doing. And it's a constant kind of battle against our own health um, to move forward. So, again, my suggestion would be to get back to that acceptance and adjustment phase. Um, and it's hard, you know, like it's super hard to kind of hold yourself back. But, you know, it's like, um, you got to hold yourself back, it's like a slingshot, and then propel forward with progression, you know what I mean? So if you can hold yourself back, conserve the energy, but continually to work on your health, then you're going to start to feel better, you know? And I'd rather that than kind of have a good day here and a bad day there. Um, so, yeah, so if you, you know, if you are in that kind of, you know, pushing and crashing stage, you go back to acceptance and adjustment, and you need to write this stuff down, you can't. Yeah, you need, but you need to go home and write this stuff down and figure out what it is that's causing these things. She has a lovely wall now, like, for your webinar. Oh, good, yeah. 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 everywhere. Yeah. 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 That's good. You have to take a photo of yeah. um, You know, so, yeah, again, what are you telling yourself? So, mentally, I was rehearsing to myself how sick I was. No wonder I didn't improve, you know? And, of course, when I'm sick, I'm in that victim mentality and I'm just not going forward. So there's two things. There's self-denial, but then there's also, you know, that mental rehearsal of going, life's just too tough, I can't do anything. Like that Michelle story before, which I told her at the start, I said, tell me what you can do. She wrote, I can sleep, I can go to the toilet once a day, I can sit up for two minutes. That's all she had on her list. Then I told her, tell, tell me what you can't do. There was like a hundred of them. You know, I can't do this, I can't do that. And she said over that month, when I gave her some space, she said, each day I added on one thing I could do, like brush my teeth on day five. You know, and then, and then it went from I can walk to the bathroom to now walking 20 minutes. I can drive. You know, and, and the list goes over. So when people come in and see me for the first time, and sometimes I do this, depends what mood I'm in, you know, they'll sit down and they go, okay, so what can you do? And they go, nothing. I go, huh, how'd you get up those stairs today? I'm like, I walked. We do that with Nelly when she's in hospital. We go, we have like a diary of things that she's done, and we, mm. when she's feeling like really rubbish, we remind her of all the things yeah, that she has. Because done. Of, yeah, and we forget about how far we come. It's yeah. important to look back and see that. So one is, you know, what are you telling yourself? And usually it's bad. We get stuck in that negative thinking. It's a lot easier to think negatively, negatively than positively. Um, but to, to be honest, in changing my mindset once I realised I was the victim of my own illness then I could start to progress. And, you know, I started with one minute walking. I was very similar to Michelle. You know, I, yeah, I've rarely seen someone who's been as sick as I was, and that's over 70,000 patients. So, um, it took, took a long time to get better. But, you, you know, it's worth putting in the effort if you can. Um, 
figuring out what you do want in your head, you know, what do I want? Like seeing, seeing it clearly in your head can really help. So going, okay, well, I do want to feel good, you know, rather than saying, oh, I'm sick of feeling this way. But if we can have that forward thinking going, I do want to feel good. I do want to be calm. I do want to be peaceful. I do want to feel better. You know, then we can start to, you know, mentally rehearse that we can do it. And also what's important is I can do this. I can do that. Because if you keep saying to yourself, you can do that, you're going to do it. All right. Look, the number one motivational, inspirational dude in the world is Tony Robbins. What does he talk about the most? Believe, achieve. You know? Um, and as simple as it sounds, it's not. We're complex human beings, you know. We're all, I am anyway, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, it's really hard to, to sh make that shift. But if you can just make these small improvements and every day you write down one thing you did good today, I'd rather you do that than talk about all the 10 things you did badly. All right, because, you know, it's really important with this illness as we start to encourage ourselves to, to you know, see the bright side of things, you know. And, and it is tough, you know, like, my dad said to me when I was 16, this has happened for a reason. This is a blessing in disguise. What did you think I said to him? Piss off. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh, thanks, Dad. I can't wait. Another four years, mate. You know? And, but he was right. Long term. You know? Um, Marissa, I was talking to you. You came here an hour early before um, from all the trains and stuff you caught. And you said to me, which was quite fascinating to hear from a patient, you know, I'm so, I'm so glad this happened to me. Why? Because it's forced my partner and I to make decisions that we otherwise wouldn't have done. Mm. Um, I used to do a really high stressful job and I had to stop doing that. So I went to a different job so I could actually live, live, but not live work. Mm. So then uh, we made conscious decisions to, I didn't know I was sick at the time, with CFS, nobody believed me. Mm. And I started to look in juicing and fruits and vegetables and had I still been doing my old job, I wouldn't have had the time to do that. Mm. And then slowly but surely I started to research a bit more when I could, as we all know we have our off days when our brain is not in the head. <laughs> or, yeah. And um, you need to bear with me because my brain just might... That's okay. Out. But you said, but you know, what, what you said to me today was like, the it's blessing. brought it's brought me and, me and my partner together closer. I'm, I'm eating healthier than I ever would. Yeah, I'm the fittest I've ever been in my entire See? life. And I'm actually the happiest I've ever been, even though I'm still sick. See? And, and, and so like, that's a great place that you've got to. And it takes a long time to get to that place. You know, like, if you said that to me when I was sick, I probably still would have told you to... Pfft. <laughs> you know, um, but you know it's 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 true. Like you said, you know you actually listen, you you watch things in life rather than you know take it for granted. Yeah, because like I said to you, I have my thirty minutes quiet time in the morning, mm. and this morning we saw two baby grouses with mummy coming out the bushes. And had I not got sick, mm. we wouldn't be sitting down having our coffee together, having thirty minutes together quiet yeah. time, just yeah. just being, not doing anything, just be. We don't talk, we don't listen. There's nothing on. It's yeah. just quiet. Yeah. But what life is too short, we need to enjoy the simple things. Yeah. You know, like birds. And and, and that's what it comes back to. And you're in a good place right now, you know, really and I'm sure you went when I met you, you know. Yeah. You said six months ago there's no way you could be here today. No way. Yeah. So, you know, that comes back to mental health, you're like, oh these are good things. You know? Can I just really stress about the positive shift? Yeah. When I had a, a massive positive shift and I felt the energy change within me because I came from that really negative place yeah. and thinking to it's about me, doctors think I'm stupid and no, 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 no. Yeah. When I had that huge mental shift from meditating and positive meditation every single day, I felt it. And then I can, even today I'm telling myself, I will, I can, I am. Mm. Even if I'm laying there, I'm just, it's, it makes such a big difference, that positive energy. Yeah, you know, someone said to me the other day, I put up a post on Facebook, it was, I forget um, a lot, but it was like, it was something about the brain and, you know, like, you know, if we, if we start to, yeah, stress, you know, worrying, a waste of energy. That's what I said, worrying, a waste of energy. She said, oh, the only worrying burn calories. <laughs> it actually does. It does. <laughs> you know, and, and I said, she didn't write back. I don't know if she's in the room, but <laughs> she, she didn't write back, you know, and I'm like, it actually does burn calories. We burn calories all the time, but mentally we burn, we can burn more calories than exercise, physically. Isn't that amazing? You know, and, and, 
And so we don't want to do that. You know, I mean, sure, yeah, we don't want to burn energy. You know, we want to conserve energy. And so by being in a positive mind frame and mentally rehearsing the good stuff, just like me walking to PE class for 200 metres, coming back and patting myself on the back, that was a big thing. Um, there was lots of those things over my time with my recovery. Michelle's story was fantastic as well. Yeah, so tell me what you can do, not what you can't do. And this is tough to start with, <clears throat> really hard. Like, you know, for me, it would be zero and then 10, you know. And so it's important that you start to write down or talk about or think about. One of the hardest things is, I mean, you guys probably, you guys probably say all the time, like, what do I say to someone who asks me how I am? Yeah. How, how do I respond to that? So there's two ways you can do it. So the first way is like, you, you know, you go in, for me, I went to my school ground and, um, Oh, Tobes, how are you playing basketball today? You know, like thinking I'm magically cured. You know, because people don't get it. They think I've got a cold. You know, I've been sick for four years, but I've just got the flu. That's cool. Um, I wish it was that easy. And and I'd be like, no, nah, man, I'm too sick. I can't do it. You know, again, that mental negative rehearsal. But I was almost like it was an excuse. And I hated being. I hated using excuses, but I had to. And I was like defending my own like life. You know, like this is me at the moment. I can't do anything. And then when I made that shift, when I was about 18, it was just as I finished school, and I realised I started reading like self-help books and all that kind of stuff, and, and I started putting in the positive tense, and the same as you now, my room was full of stuff, you know, um, and it was a bit girly for dudes to do it back then. Can you imagine <laughs> this like, apparently cool dude like, putting like self-notes up, you know, and reading it to myself at night on a, on a Friday night party, <laughs> and uh, partying by myself. And, you know, over time when people would see me and they'd say, hey, how are you going? And rather than, because I still wasn't better, you know, I was still sick. I wasn't playing what I loved, I wasn't playing basketball, I wasn't doing what I loved. And I'd say, ra rather than say, you know, I'm crap, blah, 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 I'd say, I'm going okay, like I'm starting to do the right things for my body and I'm slowly improving. Full stop. Mm -hmm. They've got nothing to answer back to there. And then in my, head, in my head, I'm going, well, that's true, I am. You know, I'm trying my best, I want to get better, this is what I've got to do. And so, you know, if you can do that over time and consciously talk about it in that tense, you know, and, and sometimes you're going to have to say no to things and make excuses and that's okay. But, you know, just remember there are things you can do. It might be on a minimal basis, but you can do it. Like, you're all sitting here right now. It's pretty phenomenal, okay? A lot of you thought you probably couldn't, but you're here, okay? Um, I had a girl in Tasmania. Has anyone heard of Tasmania? <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> so Tasmania is this tiny little island near, uh, next to Australia. It's a part of Australia. And um, I had a seminar there. And this girl came in and she lay on the couch the whole time. And she didn't look too well. So I said, look, grab that couch, lie down, close your eyes, listen to me if you want to. Her mum was there. A year later, uh, and I never heard back from that girl. A year later, she wrote me a message on Facebook. She's like, Toby, I don't know if you remember me. Of course I remember. She was the only girl lying down on the bed. And she's like, I'm, I'm getting better. And she's like, I didn't think, I, I thought I was going to die that day when I came to see you. But that showed me that I could do something. And then over the years, she really worked towards improving the health. You know, I'll we'll talk about <coughs> the next page about the five fundamentals of health. She went into the program and, and now she's, you know, at university and doing, like, and living again. You know, she's back. Um, so that was a fantastic thing to see that, you know, sometimes we think that we can't do it, when we do, it's like, huh, it's a relief. And then we build that confidence and belief in ourselves. But just remember that, you know, that pushing yourself, don't overthrow it, yeah? Just kind of rein it in a little bit and then do like small little steps over the play, okay? It's like, everyone wants to see this, so it's like these massive hero steps and we just can't, okay? Um, so I just want to talk about that, but yeah, stress is the number one cause of chronic illness in the world right now. We're all stressed, yes. Yeah, so, you know, and yeah, I know you, you have come a long way since you've reached out, and yeah, and sometimes we have to convince ourselves before we convince others, and that was a big one for me. I had to convince myself that I was going to get better, because there was a long time that I was going to get better. There was two years where I thought I'd never be able to run again. Um, it was tough. 
But when I made that decision, I thought, well, if I can walk a minute, then maybe one day I might be able to improve to then two minutes, and then three, and then four. And then a year later, I had a 12 kilometer fun run, you know, those cancer f f fun runs. And it wasn't fun, I was crapping my pants the day before. That whole week, I'd rested, I did everything right. And it got to the day, and I said, I called a friend, I can't do it, I've got a bad ankle. You know, and, and, and like, it was like almost like an instant, um, you know, injury, even though it wasn't there, but I, there was something wrong with me. And he's like, you're doing it. I said, I can't do it, mate. My ankle, I can barely walk. And he's like, well, strap it up. You know, I'll walk with you. We can do it. Um, and it was more just like, because it was the unknown. I was like, what's going to happen? Like, am I going to be okay? And I'd done a little bit of training, but not that much. Um, and I did it only because he convinced me that I was going to be okay. And... I remember doing it and it didn't even feel like I was me in my body. It just felt like this different person running 12 kilometers. And I ran it super fast with him. It was like 60 minutes, which is, you know, quite quick. Um, and I just remember that, for me, that was like, it was just, I stopped and I just looked back and I, I had flashbacks from those years of just holding onto a fence at the front of the house walking like this, you know. Um, and so, like, those moments you need to stop and look back and go, wow, it is possible. You know. Okay, uh, I'm going to do question and answer soon as well because I think that's more important. You know, if you guys got any questions, that's cool. Um, let's not get too personal though. Okay, come on, you know. No, no joke. Uh, five pillars of health. All right. Um, you know, I can't really talk about this too much because we'd be here all night and, and that would be going against what I'm talking about, patient and stuff. But these are the most important things that self-care is going to help you improve your health. Okay. Now we know there's no cure for chronic fatigue syndrome, we know there's no magic pill, wish there was, we'd, we'd all be partying in here today, all right? but we know that these things are going to help us feel better, whether we've got chronic fatigue syndrome or not. Okay? Sleep's a big one. All right? With your sleeping routine, it, it has to be specific to you. So if I, you know, the doctor will probably tell you, you know, 12 hours of sleep, 9 hours of sleep, 7, you know, go to bed at 10 and wake up at 7, you'll be fine. All right? That's not going to work for everyone. Okay, um, I've got patients who will sleep, you know, 14 hours during the, the night and then they have to have a two hour sleep during the day. That might sound familiar to some of you who've done that. For me, I used to sleep two to three hours during the day and then eventually a great doctor told me, try not to sleep during the day, slowly wean off. So rather than going, rather than going, okay, I'm going to sleep, you know, I'm going to just cut out my daytime sleep and, you know, and just be like a dead potato on the couch, you know, not going to work. I went from three hours sleep to two and a half hours every day. Two and a half hours to two, and slowly weaned myself <coughs> off. That was fantastic for me because then it improved my nighttime quality sleep. Okay, so again, that's probably one of the biggest factors you can, you can try to improve on if you are uh, napping throughout the day. If you are, that's cool. Just kind of make it specific time and have a timer and get yourself up after it because there's nothing worse when you sleep during the day and you wake up. You feel worse than anything before, okay? So, Again, as you start to improve, you might need one sleep a week during the day, yeah, just to kind of recover from a busy week. That's okay as well. But just try to keep it consistent with your sleeping routine. But definitely, um, you know, research has shown that if you can decrease your daytime sleep, it's going to increase your nighttime sleep quality better. Um, nutrition. Don't just listen to one person's advice on nutrition because someone's going to say to you, try gluten-free, try dairy-free, try lactose, you know, all that kind of stuff. It might not work for you. I tried all those three things you know, and lots of other fads and diets. It didn't work for me. And, you know, we spent thousands of dollars on it and it just, you know, my parents did, not me. And, and... You know, when, you're, when, you, when you put energy into it and you do everything and you think it's going to make and it doesn't, it's a letdown. So what I suggest you do with nutrition is figure out what works for you. Because every single person is different. There's no point just, you know, just because someone said it that you should do it. Uh, so be really careful with diet. Um, same thing with like, you know, detoxing and juice fasting and all that kind of stuff. You're all at different levels with your health and you need to be super, super careful that you don't do something stupid and go backwards because I've seen it time and time again. You know, um, people giving tablets or supplements that actually make them feel worse and they're paying money for it. I don't get that. No, that's what frustrates me the most. Happy to spend money on something that's going to help you. Don't spend it on something that's not. And if something's not working, you need to change it. 
this is just in life in general. So like, if you're doing something consistently and you're not getting anywhere in life, then you need to change it, period. Um, you know, because if you don't change, you don't improve. So um, again, it happens in life, we go for progressions and we go, okay, we've got us to this point, but maybe we need to change it because it's not, I'm not getting, I'm plateaued. So I need to try something different in order to move forwards, okay? So don't be afraid to change, but only change when you need to. If something's working for you, don't change it. Like, I see so many people like, you know, they give up after a week because it just, you know, nothing improved. Or, you know, they do something for a month and it was working and they just stop it, you know, because, just because. And then all of a sudden it's like they go back to square one. So if something's working for you or worked for you in the past, get back onto that. Start doing it again because that's, that, that's proof in the pudding right there that what you're doing is working. Movement. Hands up if you're confused about exercise and movement. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, what have you been told? Hands up, tell me. What have you been told with exercise? Yeah? Yeah, I can walk through it. To, to walk, walk through, through it, it, push through it, yeah. How'd that, how'd that go? Yeah, not, not good. Well. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyone else been told, like, don't do it, it's going to kill you? No, I've been told I should exercise. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, You've got fibromyalgia as well? Yeah, but yeah. chronic pancreatitis is yeah. heart condition, so yeah. I've got to be careful. So you've got to be careful. Well, yeah. The, the NHS in England, yeah. um, they do a pain management course, and I've been on three. Yes. Um, it, it's like that, and people get so confused. Yeah. Yes. And like you said, it is about finding out yourself. Yeah. And it's still, you feel like you're not getting the support yeah. because you're confused. That's right, yeah. It depends on what doctor you get and what their opinion is. Absolutely. My, my GP is fantastic. Okay. But I've seen other GPs that are not. Okay. Let's clear out some things with movement then, because I think this is one of probably my uh, best topics because this is my experience. and. This is what I've studied in exercise science and things. Um, <clears throat> tell me, how are you, if you don't have the strength and energy to go into that car and go to the movies with your friend and come back, then how are you going to overcome chronic fatigue syndrome? You're not. You're not. So what do you need in order to do that? Progressive. Strength and stamina and energy. So when someone ever says to me, exercise is bad for you, you know, should never ever do exercise ever again. Um, you know, I just say that to them. I said, okay, well, how are you going to have the strength and stamina and energy to go somewhere and live again? You know, you're not. Now, the problem is exercise, in our heads, we relate to a gym. Mm -hmm. You know, all the crap we see on TV, you know, the muscle things, the six pack, and all that kind of stuff. That's also not exercise for us. Okay? Um, it's really important with exercise is that we treat it individually and we never ever compare ourselves to anyone else, ever. Uh, in life as well, okay, not just with illness. Yes? This is a wording. You do movement. <coughs> Correct. Now, which means any sort of movement. That's right. Which, which is what you're doing with your hand right now, that's movement. Exactly. <coughs> Whereas doctors will say you need to go exercise, yeah. which is saying things like the <coughs> classes and gym work. Yeah. So, so it's really it's important. It's the wording side of things. Yeah, of course. And, and you know what? I used to call it exercise. <coughs> but I realised after a while that people got scared of it. And I was too, when I first started exercising, believe it or not, I was crapping myself. My first exercise program consisted of a minute walk, I think it was two sit-ups and a wall push-up like this, you know, um, like that. And that was scary, you know. Um, that was coming from a state basketball player, you know, I was fit before I got sick. So, you know, exercise or movement, as I love to call it, is really hard to get started because we don't know where to start and we don't know how much is enough or what to do. The most important thing you need to do is make sure you don't push and crash yet. So don't set the bar too high. Okay, now movement doesn't mean go on a 10 minute walk every day just because someone said so. I've found that walking and cardiovascular exercise isn't that safe and it's also not that great in terms of results with, with recovery from ME and CFS. The best thing that I got out of the CFS conference in America, which is the biggest in the world, the best scientists, the best doctors, and here I am, this 26-year-old guy sitting at the back just listening, was that um, movement is one of the key factors to recovery. Some people didn't want to hear that, okay? And they still don't, and that's okay. 
But it's funny, the guy who was doing the, the, the seminar wrote up a program, you know, and he's like, you know, this is, this is what a program looks like for a patient, you know, you know some light stretching, um, he said wall push-ups, he said sitting down on a chair and standing up once or twice, theraband exercises with the light band, so it's um, resistive training. The program as an example that he used was the program I used for my patients. So I'm sitting there like ticking every box, just going, yes, <laughs> I did it. And so I only learned this through my own experience because I had lots of setbacks and, you know, forwards and crashing and, and, and booming and busting. But the most important thing is that it's consistent and progressive. There's no use going for one walk a week if it's sending you back for six days. There's no point walking if it's making you worse full stop. Okay? Movement can be simple as this, and this is what I get some of my patients to do, is, you know, because I know it's hard to get started. Movement is this. For some of us, it's hard sometimes, you know. Have to the side. You know, you can start to build up your muscle recovery through your legs first. Okay, again, it has to be specific to you. So, I, when I treat patients, I have to look at individually where they're at physically, you know, how much they can do in a day. And you guys can work it out yourself. I worked it out for myself, it just took me a little bit longer, you know. Um, but I give, it, I give guidelines for beginners, intermediate, and advanced. And obviously, progressing is one thing that you all want to do, okay. So, it's really important when we're progressing is that it's a 5 to 10% rule. So, let's say I went from like a minute walk, one more push up, and, and a couple of sit ups, I'd go for a minute and 10 seconds the next week a minute and 20 the week after. And for me, I'd rather everyone start on the minimalist basis they can, because it's safer. There's no point like trying the middle line and going, maybe I'll be okay today, and then crashing and setting yourself up. Because that's the, the reason why exercise has got a bad name to it is because that's what people do. Doctors and, and, and medical people say, do great exercise therapy, do a 20 minute walk and see how you feel. And then of course it's too much and then you crash, and then you go, that wasn't, that's not where you're probably gonna stop that. But if we be smart and listen to our bodies and be consistent, then we're going to actually get change. One of the biggest things that I learned and that I do with my patients, the reason why you've seen the success, is because I start with body weight, low intensity exercise. Okay? Starting in the chair. Starting on the floor sometimes. And building up slowly but surely. Okay? Massive research about fibromyalgia. Hands up, you've got fibro in the room. Yeah, a couple of you. Cool. Yeah. Exercise is like number one for recovery of fibro. Yeah, so it's obviously going to be super careful, you know, um, but yeah, start on a minimal basis and, and, and improve slowly. Has anyone got a, a, a question on exercise? Because I think it's an important topic. Yep. Well, I wanted to say that in the group that we were in, yeah. um, we found through the years that education is the way forward. Yes. Basically, what we're doing. Mm. And um, we do the same thing, we learn exactly what you did. Yeah. And it's the thing is getting the individuals to be in the right space to do it. Mm. And once that they, they see that after a period of time, then it starts to that's right, and and the thing is, it's got to, you know you got to start really low, and the problem is you're not going to see a change overnight. I remember I went to I dressed up in my dad's suit when I was 18, and I was all chuffed up and ready to go. And, you know, slowly recovered. I was confident. I knew I could help people, and I knocked on doctors' doors. I made phone calls, and they all laughed at me. And then one doctor saw me, which is Dr. Uh, Dr. Lauren Lewis, who spoke at the conference, and he looked at my program and he goes, four week program." He's like, "How are people going to get better in four weeks?" I'm like, "Oh yeah." You know, it's not a four week thing, it's a forever thing. We've got to improve slowly but surely. So I changed the program from four to 12 weeks. And he looked at it, he's like, that's more like it. And he started referring patients to me because he believed in that, that was the right thing to do. And by week eight, that's when we noticed physical change. You research it in physiological um, books that, you know, it takes, you know, six to eight weeks for the body to adapt and change. Okay, so it's really important that we slowly but surely do it. And yes? also with movement, um, especially with fibro, but I guess with everybody yep. who has a movement on, the blood doesn't move around, so the oxygen is not getting around. Mm. So the blood becomes stale, and therefore the, the organs in your body are not working properly, and therefore you need the movement to start to create things yeah. to work properly, thinking mentally as well as physically. Can I say one thing? Movement doesn't have to be 
exercise movement is getting from your bed to your bathroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? We found when Lily's been in hospital for like two weeks or whatever, being coached in college and filled with more things, physio, 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 and then someone will come and, be, and then say two, three weeks later and she can make it to the end of the ward. Oh, you're better, go home. Yeah. Okay, yeah. drugs, obviously, yeah. see you in two weeks. And then there's no weeks. ongoing help and, and support. No. And that's it. As soon as she walks to the end of the ward, the physio's are like, yeah, she's great, so I'm going to go home. Yeah. And then it's like, great, she's off to the water, she doesn't have to That's right, yeah, and that's the hardest thing, because we do, and then we go back to setbacks, because we, we, and then we're told by professionals, like, okay, we've improved, we're good to go, we go, we go backwards, okay. So again, I'd be really mindful of who you're listening to. Are you listen to someone who hasn't had it before, and who doesn't really know or care about you, or are you going to listen to someone who has been through what you've gone through and overcome it? And listen to yourself, because what I'm saying might not, might not work for you, you need to figure it out for yourself. Um, you know, it's really important that you start to figure out the answers for you. And I quickly go back, and uh, some of these girls missed it. Um, what came from that chronic fatigue conference in, in America this year was the number one thing that helps people with, with this illness and all chronic illnesses is self care. Self care. And there's these researchers who are spending 20 years on trying to find a magic pill, and then they're still saying this stuff. So it's condescending. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, and I felt I was sitting there in a room of a hundred scientists and researchers and doctors, and I'm sitting here going, "So my stuff is right." Mm -hmm. You know, like, why don't why aren't these guys talking about this stuff if they know it's the right thing? So self care, because we can control it, is the number one thing that you can start working on right now. Um, almost done. We'll break it up and then we can do a bit of a question and answer. So movement, I hope I've covered that to a degree. Obviously it's individual and it's specific. Number one, don't prepare yourself. Number two, make sure it's low intensity, um, you know, low resistance, low impact exercise. Super important. Don't go to a gym and see a trainer who thinks they can help you and then they ruin you. Because it happens all the time. We might feel good. Stand up with your back sore. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, it's, it's really important that, yeah, you, you, you need to explain to them progression. So progressive exercise or progressive movement isn't about pushing yourself 120% and being superhero and then crashing down and feeling crap. Uh, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, I mean, we, I work in gyms, I've seen it my whole life, and you know, people pay money to feel crap. What? You know, one of my one of my missions in my life when I started with you know setting up the centre and stuff back in Melbourne that not one person who walk, walked through my doors would feel any worse than they did before they came in. That was my goal. And the amount of people come through and then at the end of the session they feel crap, they kind of like, yeah, what have I done this week? And then at the end of the session they're like, oh, I feel a little bit better today. You know? And that's what it's about, is making sure that you do something without making yourself feel worse. What do you say about walking, sorry? Yeah. Is that if you walk too much? Yeah, look, so walking, it depends on where you're at with your recovery. Some people just can't walk. Some of them are safer to get a stationary bike, which has been really effective and, and, and people talked about that. But again, I didn't have that, so I started with walking to start with. Um, Floor-based exercises, which is in the online program we've seen, starting with some safe, effective exercise like that, and then rebuilding would be more important. But again, we, we all need to walk, yeah? yeah? So we do need to implement it at some stage. It's just about when we do it and maybe how much. What I find about walking is it's more beneficial just to get outside of the house. Exactly. That's the main thing. Whereas That's right. Floor based is all kind of yeah. indoors. Yeah, thing. yeah. So, so getting out of the house and sitting there doing some stretches on a park bench is still good. But again, just do what you can. One of my patients at the moment I'm seeing in the UK who couldn't make it today, for him it's about getting outdoors and sitting down at a bench. You know what I mean?